This is CPSC 526626, lecture number six on the topic of certificates. So we have these public key crypto primitives that are really useful. We can sign messages, which is great. We can encrypt things for other people without having to establish a shared secret first. We can just get someone's public key and send them a message encrypted with their public key. And we can also use this to do key exchange to establish session keys and then have fast crypto like AES running then behind the scenes. So it gives us nice properties, confidentiality, integrity of messages, authenticity of messages, non-repudiation in the sense that if you sign something, it means that you actually signed it. it, it no one else could have forged your signature in a sense. But... It does require that these public keys are authentic. If you don't have the authentic version of a public key, then you're not really talking to the person you think you're talking to. If you think Bob's public key is X, but it's really Y, it could be that Eve's public key is X, and you're actually talking to Eve, and Eve is then forwarding it to Bob and men in the middle attacking you. And this is a hard problem. We need an authentic channel so that you can have authentic public keys. But you've never met any representative of any website you've ever visited. So if you just go to a website and you are able to establish a secure communication channel, something has to have happened to actually give you the authentic version of their, of their public key. Because there has to be an authentic channel at some point in order for that information to be actually delivered. But by the initial configuration, no one has public keys for anyone, and the only way to actually obtain one is for them to give it to you in an authentic manner. So suppose we have Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob both have their own public and private keys. Alice and Bob have never met, and Alice needs Bob's public key to encrypt a message. So Alice wants to tell Bob something, but they've never met before, or maybe they've met before, but during that time they didn't exchange business cards that had their public keys written on it, for example. So Alice does not know what Bob's public key is. So she could just ask. She could say to Bob over the normal internet, hey, Bob, could you send me your public key? I want to mail you some, some information. And she then receives a public key. But there's no evidence that this is Bob's public key. It could have been a man in the middle, Eve, who replaced Bob's public key with her public key. And Alice has no way of knowing if that actually happened. Alice needs a way to validate the key that she received despite having no authentic channel, despite no bits being exchanged over an authentic channel. There is, at the initial point of communication, Alice and Bob are communicating, but not over an authentic channel, an insecure, unauthentic channel. And they have to communicate information that results in Alice receiving an authentic version of Bob's public key. So how do we do this? We cannot bootstrap trust. It really has to start from somewhere. With a small amount of trust, a kernel of trust, you can exchange keys, session keys, and then with the session keys, you can do lots and lots of crypto. But still, if in the absence of any trust, in the absence of any trust in the information that you're receiving, we, we can't actually get these nicer properties out. We can't get an authentic channel. We can't just turn an insecure channel into an authentic channel uh, without doing something to make that happen. So, one solution to this problem is known as trust on first use. And this is widely used. It's, it's uh, acronymized as TOFU. And... The idea of trust on first use is as follows. I get something that claims to be Bob's public key. So I, again, over an insecure channel, I just say, Bob, what's your public key? Bob gives me something, and I then just conclude that this is Bob's public key. But importantly, I only believe that this key is Bob's public key. So if later Bob sends me a different one, I say, ah, no, no, I'm not going to fall for it. It's not that. And if I ever receive anything else, I'm very suspicious, so I refuse to use it. And I'm safe forever. 
I have an authentic channel unless I was being attacked at that first time. So what makes Tofu such an interesting strategy is that either you're vulnerable always, forever, constantly, from the very start, or your security is perfect. It it makes it an all-or-nothing proposition. Because if the way it worked was every time you wanted to talk to Bob, you just asked Bob what's your public key, and you got something, and then you encrypted it on the message, well, maybe 10% of the time you were, it's a man-in-the-middle attack, and you're, uh, you're you're receiving the wrong key. The other 90% of the time, you're safe. And with the using a tofu strategy, it makes it that as long as you received it authentically the first time, then you are safe then after. There's no way that they, someone can then decide later, oh, I want to interfere with your communications with Bob and break it then. There's some work that looks into sending the key over multiple channels at the same time. So, for instance, if you're connecting with a phone using, for instance, cell phone internet and Wi-Fi internet at the same time to get the sick key, and as long as both of them are the same, it means that the information is likely to be correct because Eve would have to interfere with both channels simultaneously, which makes it a bit harder to do in practice. But ultimately, it's still relying on a tofu strategy with an extra mechanism to make it harder to attack at that one time. And what's also nice about tofu is that if you ever do meet Bob, you can then check what his public key is. So if you use the Signal messaging app, you may see that you're able to chat with your friends. And then there's a verification mechanism that you can actually do with your contacts when you visit them in person. And this is exactly what this is happening. It's you're verifying their public key. And because you're using Tofu, you know that either all of your communications have been hijacked from the beginning of time, if it fails, or if it passes, everything is as secure as it would have been if you had actually gotten the public key ahead of time. So it means that all of these past communications are just as secure as though you waited to make sure you got an authentic public key first before you ever sent a single message. So convenience, because you don't have to do that, at a risk of security, because if that public key is wrong, then you have been at risk the entire time you've been communicating. Another approach, another solution, is a central on-demand service. The idea here is that Alice goes to the service and asks for Bob's key. It says to the service, I'd like to talk to Bob, and gets a key. Or, maybe, Alice gets Bob's key from Bob, and then goes to the server and says, is this Bob's key? Would this be practical? Would this be practical at internet scale, for imagining every single user trying to validate every website they visit's public key? It would be quite a burden on the on the service. What about a man in the middle attack? Does Alice, if Alice doesn't have an authentic version of the service's public key, then the Alice can't establish a secure session with the service, meaning that Eve could pretend to be the service, resulting in attacks. This is again coming back to this idea of a kernel of trust. If Alice could trust the kern the service, she could use the service to get Bob public key. But without that initial trust, it's the same thing as just trusting what you, the response you get. So Alice goes to the service and says, what's Bob's public key, and gets something, and hopefully the service is not under Eve's control. What about replay attacks? What if Bob changes his key, and the service has an old version, and maybe Bob's key was compromised, and the service has an old version, and so now Alice is receiving the wrong version of Bob's key. Or DOS attacks. This is an attack on availability, denial of service. Alice wants to use the service to communicate with Bob, but if the service is down, what does she do? Just not communicate with anyone anymore? Or just risk it and chat anyways, even though they can't validate the key? 
having a central point of failure is, of course, a risky proposition. It means that if it fails, then it is unavailable to service any requests. And it also represents a juicy target for attackers because taking down such a system would result in no one being able to communicate. What about the service being corrupt? Eve runs the service and, you know, maybe they don't do attacks all the time, but maybe for specific people under specific circumstances is worth sacrificing their reputation in order to make the attack happen. So now we're thinking in terms of foreign intelligence types of attacks where it's not that they're routinely being a dishonest service all the time, but they're just building up a brand, building up trust, having lots of people use them, and then when a particular target wants to use them, then they mount an attack and no one notices. And also I wanted to ask, does this remind you of anything, this, this, this idea? And so I can pause and think about it for a second. But there is some similarities in, in, in feeling with... Um, the Needham Schroeder protocols and, and Kerros, this idea of having a trusted third party who is the entity responsible for facilitating all of the communication between Alice and Bob. So we have a whole uh, a star topology again, one node in the center, and every in order to bridge a connection from two individual entities, they go through this central server to establish their trust. So enter certificates which is the main solution that we use to this problem of uh, obtaining public keys, at least in terms of the amount of internet-secured communications that are occurring on a daily basis. So a certificate is a statement about a public key. Something like, this certifies that key XYZ belongs to Bob. Yours most sincerely, Trent, the trusted third party. So Trent... Like Alice and Bob, Trent is the name of the trusted third party. And the idea is that Alice and Bob, they, everyone knows Trent. Everyone trusts Trent. It's, a, it's an authority. And Bob is able to send his public key to Trent over an authentic channel. So Bob, we, we'll assume for now and explain a bit more later, but we assume that Alice and Bob both have Trent's authentic public key. Bob sends his public key to Trent, and Trent then prepares a document stating that Bob owns the key. So Trent somehow decides whether or not this really is Bob, and then if he concludes it is, signs a statement saying, yes, this is Bob's public key. And then he signs it with his own private key, so anyone with Trent's public key can verify it, and then... Trent appends the signature to the document and gives the result to Bob. The key point is that Bob can show this to anyone without involving Trent. Trent does not ever have to know that Alice wants to talk to Bob. Trent is unaware that his signature is being validated by Alice in order to establish a communication with Bob. Trent just signed the statement, Alice trusts Trent, Alice gets a statement from Bob that says, here's my public key signed by Trent, or here's Bob's public key signed by Trent. Alice can then trust that it's Bob's public key. All she needs is Bob's public key and the signed document, the certificate, and Trent's public key. And then Alice can verify that Trent's signature is valid for the document, and then thereby concluding that Bob's public key is indeed the one purported to be. Now, does this remind you of anything? Does this flow remind you of anything? And hopefully it does remind you a little bit of these tickets in Kerberos. This idea that Bob used the trusted third party to obtain a signature or to obtain a message or to obtain some evidence, an authenticator, we called it in Kerberos. But from that point on, Trent is no longer involved. In the same way that the user, Alice, goes to the key distribution center, the off, the off server, and gets a ticket-granting ticket, 
when Alice then goes to the ticket granting service and shows the ticket granting ticket, the auth service is never aware of that anymore. Alice can keep using that ticket granting ticket until it expires. And in the same way, the certificates work. The certificates are prepared by a trusted entity, but then delivered to the person who isn't actually going to use them or ever will even need them. Bob doesn't need to know his own public key. He knows his own public key. He doesn't need a certificate to validate the signature of Trent to prove it. What he does is he's entrusted to deliver this ticket or certificate to the other party so that they can do it, so that Trent can be left alone and doesn't have to be involved in all of that communication, which, of course, reduces the overall cost of his computations and network communications that would be involved if you compared it to a solution where Trent was pinged every single time any kind of uh, certificate needed to be checked. So in short, the protocol works as follows. Alice has Trent's public key. We'll assume that for now. We'll worry about that later. Alice contacts Bob. Bob gives Alice the certificate signed by Trent. If Alice, Alice then checks that the signature is valid using Trent's public key, and as long as Trent is honest, then it is in fact Bob's public key. That's the basic protocol. After this, we have turned Trent's public key into, in a sense, we've used it to turn into Bob's public key. We've used Trent's public key as a way to facilitate the authentic retrieval of Bob's public key. So in practice, this document is called a digital certificate, or a cert for short. So we just call them certs. And Trent is called a certificate authority, or a CA short for Certificate Authority. And this infrastructure is widely deployed. You're using it all the time when you do things on the internet. You're getting a public key from Bob, you're checking that's signed by Trent, and checking Trent's signature on it before you continue communicating with Bob. This is happening all the time. So what can go wrong with this design? What are some attacks? What are some possible failures that could occur with this protocol? <clears throat> Recall again the protocol. Bob delivers to Alice a certificate signed by Trent that says that this is his public key. And then Alice checks it because Alice has Trent's public key to check the, cert the signature on the certificate. So, first, perhaps most clear is what well, we sort of haven't filled in the blanks yet. Al how does Alice get Trent's public key? So Alice doesn't have an authentic key for Trent. It could be bad in the first place. It could have changed and Alice isn't aware of that. <clears throat> if that's the case, then Alice will not be able to validate any uh, certificates correctly or their for certificates themselves may be forged if they're being signed by someone who isn't actually a real certificate authority. It could be that Eve pretended to be Bob, and Trent gives her a Bob certificate, right? We talked about Bob presents his public key to Trent, and Trent signs it and says, this is Bob's public key, but how does Trent know who Bob is? How does Trent get any certainty that this thing that he's signing is, in fact, a thing for Bob? It could have been that Eve has gotten this. And this has actually happened many times in the real world. So this isn't just a hypothetical risk. Importantly here, it's one thing for everyone to know Trent, but it's a different thing for Trent to know everyone. Right? The idea of this system is that every user who wants to go to any website, they don't need to pre-collect all of the certificates for every website. They just need to know one. They just need to know the certificate for, or the public key for Trent. That's it. As long as they know the public key for Trent, then everyone else can use Trent to sign their public key. So in this case, everyone knows Trent. All the websites know Trent. All the users know Trent. And Trent is responsible for providing all of the security. But Trent can't know everyone in the same way that everyone just knows Trent. There's far too many people. So if Bob wants the signature of a of, for a certificate, Trent has to somehow check his ID or something like that. Like, how does Trent actually figure out whether or not this is really Bob? <clears throat> what if Trent is Eve? What if 
Trent isn't a honest certificate authority? What if it's a corrupt certificate authority? Or what if it's a was an honest one but became corrupt by being bribed, by being as an entity, as a corporate entity, corruptible by virtue of having a profit motive? What if Trent isn't completely secure against all possible cyber attacks? What if Eve breaks into Trent's computer, steals Trent's public key, or uses it for a short amount of time to make certificates that aren't valid? So all of these attacks can exist. But what about from the user's perspective? What do they see when they go through this entire certificate process? What is the user's understanding of this whole system working as intended? And the answer is this. You see the green lock icon on your website. And you see an S after HTTP. S is for secure. So HTTP secure, you get a lock icon, perfect. That's the indication. That's the entire user interaction with this system. Users don't know about certificate authorities, and they shouldn't need to know about certificate authorities. They don't know about the variety of certificate authorities or the fact that certificates are being issued with timestamps and signatures, and the signatures are being checked, and sometimes something goes wrong with the signatures or the timestamps. Certificates invalid is expired. Users have certainly seen a website they go to and it says the cert is expired and presumably are just puzzled as to what this exactly means because from the user's perspective, it's this green lock icon or it's missing. It's not there. That's the user's interaction with this system. And this is good. This means that it is, in a sense, this, this zero-click security, that the user doesn't need to understand how the whole system works in order to benefit from the security that's provided. These lock icons are called security indicators. They come with this notion of least surprise, meaning that if you see a, a lock icon, it should mean that it is secure and not that it's just a picture of a lock icon and not actually secure. And we'll talk a bit more about that later uh, in, in a later lecture where we talk about UI uh, features that can be used to fool users. But even with this lock icon, what does it mean? <clears throat> what does the the presence of a lock mean? It's HTTPS, it's encrypted, we're using encryption, but we still haven't answered the question of what did the certificate authority do in terms of their diligence in ascertaining the fact that Bob is the public key that they're signing is in fact Bob's public key. How do they know for sure that it is Bob and not Eve pretending, you know, wearing a Bob costume? In particular, did Trent meet with Bob? Check his ID. Did they meet? Who is Trent? Well, <clears throat> this comes to the notion of a CA's duties. So Bob claims that, say, Bob.com is his domain. Bob wants to use some key, PK, as the public key for Bob.com. So what are the checks that the CA, the certificate authority, what must the CA do before issuing the cert to Bob? What are the checks? What should they actually check? And I encourage you to pause and think about the, the set of things you would check and see what, what, ma or what would happen. So one, you would want to at least have evidence that whoever you're talking to also controls the private key. Because... If someone's saying, oh yeah, this is this is my public key, you could get them to prove it by, say, having them sign something random so that you can say, okay, yeah, and they, they, they must also know the private key or otherwise it couldn't have created the signature. And they're claiming that they control Bob.com so you can use Bob.com as part of the process. You could say, put the answer to this signature, put this somewhere on Bob.com. So I can go to Bob.com, download it, and see that it's there. This would be a sort of basic level of verification. It turns out there's more, there's different levels of verification. We'll get to that shortly later in this lecture. What about Alice's duties? Well, Bob sends to Alice, effectively, a cert, which is signed by Trent, and then turn signed by Bob. So 
The certificate says Bob.com signing key is PK. And this is then signed by Trent. And this whole thing is then signed by Bob's PK. So what does Alice need to do before she can trust the cert? Well, first, she'll have to check that Bob's signature is valid using PK from the cert. She'll have to trust that Trent's signature is valid, which she has access to, so she can check that on the cert. What else should she check? She should check that Bob.com is where she wanted to go, that they're not just giving a valid cert for some other domain. Because this has actually happened. There was an, a researchers discovered that poorly designed APIs used in SSL implementations failed to check that the search cert matched the sender, meaning that you could go to a website, bob.com, and they would just send you a certificate for eve.com, and you do all the checks and say, oh, it's a perfectly valid cert, and then just use that. Without realizing that you never even meant to go to eve.com. And many, it wasn't an issue in browsers, but it was in non-browser software, such as Amazon's EC2 Java library, Amazon and PayPal merchant SDKs, Trillion and AIM instant messaging clients, uh, and some other other Android applications and libraries. So this was basically making all of the signatures are valid, except the cert was for Eve instead of Bob. And then you would just use it and think you were talking to Bob. So again, this was fixed with just a software check, you know, check that the bob.com is equal to the thing that you went you went to, but shows that you do have to do all these checks in order for this to actually work. And of course, yeah, as a result, any SSL connections from these programs, SSL being this, the uh, HTTPS or TLS, the secure socket over the internet, they were all vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks because you could just provide a cert you knew the private key for, and it would just, as long as the cert looked good and was signed by Trent, it would pass. Another problem Alice could do is fail to actually check the cert, fail to check the signature. This was known as the go-to fail, and it's an interesting, it's an interesting feature of of the C and C++ language in that it has this construct where if you have a parenthetical expression for an if for a while, and you only have one statement after, you don't need braces. And what you, if you read through this code, you'll see that the fourth go-to is misaligned in its tabbing. It shouldn't be tabbed in. It should be tabbed out at the same level as all the other ifs. And... In some cases, it makes it makes better sense to just simply always use braces to protect against exactly this sort of problem, because then you know you're delimiting your blocks correctly, and you can avoid this risk. But it's an interesting thing how features of different programming languages will allow for programmer errors like this to occur and go unnoticed. And it could also... You know, it's programmer error, but other in other cases, you could imagine a malicious insider makes code that fails on purpose, but also makes it look innocuous to anyone doing a code review. Now, in this case, what happens is the first, all of these uh, if ca uh, cases correspond to errors. So if something goes wrong, goes to fail. If something goes wrong, go to fail. If something goes wrong, go to fail. And you see at the bottom, the fail returns the error. So whatever error happens in this process gets returned. So what happens with the fourth go-to fail is it triggers no matter what, but no error has occurred. So error is actually zero. So what this code does is it bypasses the line right before the fail, which is error equals SSL raw verify, the thing that actually verifies the cert. 
And since error is zero when the fourth go to fail occurs, it just returns zero, which in this case means that everything's fine. No problem. Certificate check passed. But actually what happened was none of this code was reachable. And so another mechanism that's used in software engineering is to actually not permit inaccessible code from being present when you're compiling it. Meaning that if you had something like a go-to before a block of code that just returned an error, it would just trigger a compile warning saying the, the, the this chunk of lines is actually inaccessible, um, so you I won't even compile this program. It's not even a warning. It just won't be allowed to compile. Let's say that Bob's private key is stolen. What's the worst that can then happen in this case? So Bob has a private key corresponding to his public key. The public key is signed by Trent, created these certificates. And these certificates exist on everyone's computer that has ever in the past gone to Bob.com. And then suddenly his private key is stolen meaning that the person who stole it, Eve, can then act on behalf of Bob, sign things on behalf of Bob. So in the, in the context of using certificates to secure internet connections, what's the worst that can happen? And so basically, we'd have Eve being able to imposter Bob forever. Because all of the checks that we have... Alice checks the cert. Alice checks the signature from Trent. Trent's key doesn't change, and and the cert doesn't change, and Bob's key stays the same. And that means that if Eve can convince Alice to go to Eve.com, Eve can pretend to be Bob.com, and this will just happen forever. So what can we do to stop it? Well, if we'll think, think about Kerberos. What do we do there? We had a notion of a lifetime. We, it wasn't the case that these keys could just be run or be used forever, or these tickets could be used forever. Instead, there was a lifetime associated with them. And you would have to get a new one every day, for example. So can we apply this concept to... the idea of certificates. And so this is where certificate revocation comes from. To revoke means to no longer trust this cert. This is because we recognize that keys can get stolen, or they could be suspected to be stolen, or that someone who had access to a key changes company so they shouldn't be able to use this key anymore, or Bob just wants to use a new key instead. Maybe a new technology comes around in, in public keys and it's, these other keys are nicer, have some other properties. Bob just uses that instead. Or he switches computers and he doesn't want to bother copying the key over so he just creates a new one and says, let's just use this key instead. These certificates are just sta signed statements though. Once they're signed, once Trent has signed that this is Bob's key, that can't be undone. There's no mechanism to say that to unsign something. This is the non-repudiation as well. You signed a statement, that signature proves that you looked at that statement and decided to sign it. So how do we remove trust once issued? So one is to have a cert revocation list, a CRL. This is just a list of bad certs. So there's a whole bunch of certs, and they're all signed by Trent. And then Trent also makes out a list of certs that he says, forget these signatures, these are all bad. Forget all these certs. And, and then he signs that, so you can trust that list too. And so this list would just contain every single bad cert that exists. So it would grow quite a lot, especially in the result of some... Uh, major problems such as the SSL bad, SSL having a bad key generation on Ubuntu systems in, I believe it was 2006, around that time. Um, all of the certs, all of the public keys that were generated were bad because they had bad randomness. 
And all of the certs then, therefore, had to be revoked. So checking this certificate revocation list, this is an order and task. You have to go through every single cert and check, is this the cert that's on this list? Now you can index the cert revocation list to do these sort of searches faster. But still, in order to do it effectively, you have to store the entire certificate revocation list. And then these are periodically pushed out to parties, like every week you get your new list, which means there's also a gap in time from when a cert should be revoked and when everyone finds out about it. Another technique, and this is crucial to make sure that these CRLs don't just grow unbounded forever, is to make certificates expire. This gives you an upper bound on the use of stolen keys. You can steal a key, let's say a cert expires in a month, and so every month you have to get a new you have to get a new signature. Well, you could just at that time just generate a new key. Why not? If you're getting a new certificate, might as well get a new certificate on a fresh key. So, if you have your certs expire every month, it allows you to come up with a new key even if you don't know it was compromised, even if there's no evidence it was compromised, you just get a new key anyway. So if it was compromised, now the damage is limited to a month. Certificate authorities like it because it keeps them having customers. Certificate authorities uh, typically get paid for their services, so having people have to request certs more often is good for their business. And it also stops these revocation lists from just growing forever, from becoming longer and longer and longer, um, and as a result becoming a bit unmanageable. Another approach is known as CRL deltas. The idea here is that instead of publishing the whole CRL, you just give updates, deltas, so that instead of saying, okay, here's the entire certificate revocation list, download it and save it, you would just say, here's what's new in the last week, and then here's what's changed in the last week. Now, in order for this to work, you actually have to be subscribed. You have to do, every user has to be actively engaged in keeping their list up to date, getting the delta every week, crossing off the certs that are bad, and, and so forth. But it does reduce the communication cost of sending out these CRLs. Another approach is online status checking. These are known as OCSP protocols. And we're going to see some examples of this in network traffic when we start looking at uh, network traffic. And the idea here is to use an always online party to check if a cert is valid. So not Trent. You don't go to Trent and say, Trent, is this still good? But you just offload the certificate revocation list to somebody else that you trust. So there's another trusted entity, Tom. And Tom maintains the list of all of the certificates that are on certificate revocation lists. So he's, the, he's in charge of keeping track of all the CRLs. You don't want to bother with that, and you don't want to go through the process of getting all the deltas and updating it. So you just ask Tom, is this on your list or not? So at the time when Alice is about to use a cert, Alice can do a check. Hey, Tom, is the cert still good? Tom says yes or no. So this does incur a cost. Now, someone is being checked every single time anyone does anything on the internet. So this does incur an additional cost in the sense that now Tom is, has to be involved in all these communications. But you can reduce the cost of that by, for instance, having your ISP do it. So if every ISP manages a online certificate status checking protocol uh, system, then every user of that ISP can just ask their ISP and the amount of total internet traffic is greatly reduced because it's just going to the ISP and back. So it would happen really quickly. Another approach is called OCSP stapling. And the idea here is that instead of Alice checking the, o the status of a cert every single time she goes to a website, the website's get a signed statement that their cert is still good from an OCSP service. So they have a cert, or they have a public key, they get it signed by Trent, the certificate authority, 
And then every couple hours, they get it signed statement from Tom, the OCSP provider, that says, yep, this isn't on any certificate revocation list that I know of. That signature is added, say, every hour. And then when Alice requests a certificate, Bob provides the cert, which is the public key signed by Trent, and the OCSP message that Alice would have gotten if she had gone out and done it herself. So this can substantially reduce the the cost for popular websites. So if you imagine a website that's getting millions of views uh, an, a, an hour, then as a result of including an OCSP statement, Thomas only need to be bothered once per hour instead of a million times per hour. So this greatly reduces his cost in providing the service, and everyone effectively is better off. They all get the benefit of OCSP updates. They all get to see, yes, this certificate is valid, is not on any certificate revocation list that at least Tom knows about. And so I have a another rhetorical question. Does this remind you of another protocol? And yes, it all comes back to Kerberos. This idea that Bob goes out of his way to get information that he passes on to Alice just so that Alice doesn't need to uh, talk to the server in order for the protocol to work. That this can be done by Bob ahead of time communicating with a trusted third party and sending the result like a ticket uh, to the actual end recipient of that message. Another rhetorical question. What do... OCSPs provide that CRLs don't. So what does an online status checking of a of a certificate do that the system of certificate revocation lists aren't able to do? One answer is that online checking of a certificate means that information that comes from Bob, for instance, Bob saying, this cert is bad, don't trust it anymore, this key's been compromised, that information can be immediately used by end users because the OCSP is able to say this cert is bad right away. For certificate revocation lists, if they're coming, if they're being published every week, there's going to be a delay between when Bob knows his key's compromised and when the certificate revocation list knows that it's compromised which means that users will suffer through in this delay. But with online checking, the status is checked at that moment, and this can be updated by as soon as Bob informs an OCSP provider that, yes, this is an invalid cert. Another approach is to use short-lived certs. The idea here being that we make all certs valid for, say, a week. Every week you get a new cert. Now... If you lose your key, your key may be compromised, and this allows Eve to imposter your website for at most a week. Because after a week goes by, you get a new key anyways. So we don't need online checking, we don't need revocation lists, because what will end up happening instead is we've bound this delay. If the revocation list takes a week to get published and propagated, then it's the same. If it takes a week, for an example, for your broken cert to show up on a, a certificate revocation list, if you just always had your certs expire in a week, it wouldn't. you wouldn't ever even bother to publish it on a CRL. You would just say, okay, well, in a week I'll get a new one anyways. So, in a sense, they seem a bit equivalent to this this idea of a CRL and OCSP stapling, but they differ in a failure condition. So I encourage you to pause and think about this, that how are short-lived certs different from, say, a certificate revocation list?
And so the answer is that a CRL and an OCSP stapling, these are trusted parties that must exist on the internet. It must be contacted. And these mean that they can be denied service. They can be broken, taken offline. They can be attacked. They can also be not trustworthy themselves, right? Not publishing the, the bad certs, the certs that they don't want people to know are bad because they're the CRL provider is actually evil. Short-lived certs avoid all that. You don't need to check anyone. You don't need to worry about a server going offline or not being available. Your cert will just expire in a week. And if you don't get a new cert in time, then you just don't have a cert. But you don't need to worry about, for instance, trying to inform another entity on the internet that your cert is bad to protect users from being attacked. For example, suppose that your cert you knew was compromised, but then the attacker also denied service to the major CRL providers at that time. So you couldn't tell anyone that this was the, this was the case. Certs are used for TLS. TLS stands for Transport Layer Security. We're going to talk about that protocol in detail in a few lectures. But this is the de facto means to secure web traffic. This is what is used to protect users doing internet stuff, by and large. And TLS puts the S in HTTPS. That's why there's the secure at the end of the name of the protocol. And there's also an older version of TLS. So TLS is the new name, Transport Layer Security. It used to be known as Socket SSL, Secure Socket Layer. Um, but it's the same idea. It came from the same lineage. So it's just different versions, and they renamed it at one point. In practice, Alice goes to Bob.com. Alice gets a cert for a public key that the owner of Bob.com has a private key for. Now here, we, we do have a difference in, in, in these entities. Bob.com is a website, but there's a notion of someone who owns it and someone who has a private key for it. So let's talk more about that part of the process. For the web, the browser does all of this. The browser is responsible for checking if the cert is valid by checking all the fields, by checking CRLs, by using OCSP. If there's an OCSP stapling message, by checking that as well. And then if everything passes, the user sees the lock. So. What are the three types of validations for these certificates? Validations meaning the actual steps that Trent took to verify that Bob is the owner of Bob.com. So at the lowest level is domain validated, DV. And here, Bob gives a public key to the CA, the certificate authority, and claims that Bob.com is his. So how does the CA verify that Bob actually owns Bob.com or the person with the private key corresponding to that public key owns Bob.com? Well, there's a number of ways. One is they send an email to admin at Bob.com, for example. And that email could have a challenge, like a random number that they have to sign with the key. So if the internet works as it's supposed to, then Bob, do, Bob will be the only person who can answer the email admin at Bob.com because Bob actually, if Bob does control Bob.com, he'll control the email server for it as well. Another option is that they prove control over the domain. They post some DNS text records, which is just um, arbitrary text that can be associated with your domain. So you can include some additional text information on bob.com so that when someone looks up the DNS information for bob.com, they see these records. And we're going to be talking about attacks on the DNS system later on in this course. They could also put a random number up on bob.com. Bob could create a file, ca underscore challenge.html, that has the answer. What 
he does is basically up to how the CA wants to proceed. The CA will just say, all right, in order to issue you your cert, you have to sign this challenge and put it up on this website. We'll email you the challenge and you put it up on this website and then we'll check to make sure it's there. And if so, then we're going to be happy. Now, of course, there's no proof that anyone named Bob is anywhere related to this, right? It could be a rogue employee that happens to have webmaster access or happens to be able to interfere with communications that goes to Bob.com. But what's nice about domain validation is that it can be fully automated. And we'll see an example of that at the end of the lecture of a, a CA that's free and able to do these domain validated certificates for anyone. Right? It's automated because all that happens is you submit a key, you receive a challenge, you post the answer to the challenge, you receive a cert. Right? This is now a protocol. It's no longer a envelopes being exchanged among actual humans at this point. The next step up is known as organization validated, OV. So the first one, domain validated, they just check that you control the domain. That's it. Organization validated, there's also checking whether there's a business or organization that's behind this key. For instance, they could look up a business in a public directory and call them and, you know, ask to whoever answers the phone, ask to, you know, talk to whoever's in charge of issuing the certificate and hopefully being able to be routed to the right person. Now, the exact practices depends on the specific CA. So there's no real set of rules about what exactly you're supposed to do to do an OV certificate. Different CAs can do different things, and their statements say that for any OV certificates we issue, we require this and this and this. And then this additional information that they looked up this business, they called this, uh, they, that this business is associated with this particular private key, this then is part of the cert. So there's additional information then that's stored in the certificate, not just a signature of the private key and saying it belongs to Bob.com. But of course, the user only sees the lock icon. So there's not much of a benefit from the user side to have organization validated. If they see the lock icon, they're happy. If they don't see the lock icon, they're not happy. The final step, though, and this one has powerful impact on users, is known as extended validation. And the idea here is that there is use of government databases to confirm the existence of legal entities named as a, the subject of the certificate. So it's not just, oh, I look up their phone number in a phone book and call them. It's, I use a government database to confirm that there is a legal corporation or entity under this name. And... Then that name goes in the browser bar. So if you've ever been browsing and suddenly you see Mozilla Corporation in the browser bar, this is the legal name on the certificate that Mozilla has been issued by a certificate authority. Now, these EV issuers are audited. They have a governance structure. It's not that anyone can just become an a EV certificate issuer a certificate authority that's issuing these EV certificates. And the actual certificate requests involve human lawyers. It's not an uh, automated process where you just send an email to some address and they email you back a challenge and then you put that answer on your website. There's actually a process involving human lawyers that are cooperating in order to produce these certificates. But the consequence of this is a different user experience. The user actually sees the legal name of the corporation with these. And you may have seen these in the context of banks, for example, or large financial, large corporations, entities that want to produce an additional amount of trust among the people using them. You'll see these certificates or you'll see these legal names in the browser bar. But of course... If you don't expect to see them and you don't know why they're there and you're not expecting to need to see them, not seeing them will not really give you any warning bells. It won't alarm you. It won't necessarily scare you. But hopefully, 
If you're used to going to your bank and always seeing the name of your bank spelled out and then suddenly it disappears, maybe that serves as a as a, a an alarm in your mind. And here's a, a selection of different browsers with how they do these things. You can see that they actually put the legal name in the browser Chrome uh, and and this is exactly for this reason that there is an extended validation certificate that's happening here. All right, back in 2008, researcher Sutarov et al. collected 30,000 website certificates. So this team found that 9,000 of them were signed using MD5 hash. Now we know that MD5 hash was it secure. We saw that it is not collision resistant, that it was used in software updates in, in state level sponsored cyber attacks. And in 2008, it should have been, it shouldn't have been used at this point. It was already known to have some weaknesses as the protocol. 97 of those were issued by one certificate authority called Rapid SSL, but there was others that were doing it as well. Now, what was wrong with signing with MD5? Well, MD5 has collisions, and collisions are bad. And if you can collide documents in a way, you can create new ones that the signature is valid, but the date is different. And this can be devastating depending on the particular file format. Depending on how the data is organized, can... The, the effects can vary. And part of the problem is that if even if the certificate authorities didn't use MD5 for their certs, browsers were still accepting them as valid certs. So browsers could have just refused to accept MD5 certs, but they weren't, and as CAs could have refused to use MD5 in their certs, but they weren't. And as a result, 30,000 websites had broken certs. So the process of breaking them works like this. The cert itself consists of a serial number, its lifespan, then the domain name that bob.com, and then the RSA key, the public key, then some extension fields and, and the signature from Trent, the certificate authority. So if you can do a hash collision on the part before the signature at the end, then you're able to effectively have a signature for whatever key that you, whatever you want. Because you have a signature you can replace the domain cert and you can change its validity to as long as you want and all you have to do is compute some or, or play around with some of the bits that you have access to in order to create a prefix collision. So they found that finding these collisions back in 2008 took an, about one to two days on a cluster of 200 PlayStation 3s. So you might be wondering, what does that look like? It looks like something like this. They just had a cluster of PlayStation 3s. You may be wondering, why would they have a cluster of PlayStation 3s? And the answer to that is that often these uh, console manufacturers subsidize the cost of their hardware and make up for it by selling games. So they intentionally sell devices at a loss in order to uh, produce a higher expected revenue by all the people buying all their games, controllers, extra accessories, and so forth. And so it made it an excellent way of doing cheap, high-performance computing because the actual hardware was, you know, cheaper than it should have been. And as well, they have graphics cards. Graphics cards are great for doing these parallelizable algorithms. So you could do hash collision searching using graphic cards on hardware that was subsidized by the manufacturer. And as a result they went with the PlayStation 3 cluster for the research. But there's another problem with certificates. And 
even when we're using correct hash functions, so we're not having these collisions where people can produce their own certificates. And that is that the number of certificate authorities that your computer trusts is staggering. We asked earlier rhetorically, who are these certificate authorities? Well, you can go to your browser and you will find pages and pages and pages and pages of these certificate authorities coming from all sorts of entities, government agencies, corporations, certificates from countries that you'll never visit a website for, for example, non-democracies. There's many many certificates that are issued but there's also many certificate authorities that are able to issue these certificates and any one of these certificate authorities can issue a certificate that your browser will trust the same as anyone else so all of these entities and each one of these you can have more than one certificate will be able to produce a certificate for any website they want, and your browser will trust it the same. Whether it comes from a, co a company like Amazon that you might have heard of, or a company that you've never heard of in your life. And so you can go look at a certificate, and you can see here's an example of a certificate. and shows you the issuer's name and their country, the validity period, the algorithm that they're using for their public key cryptography. Any of the certificates signed by any of that list of certs of certificate authorities is accepted as completely valid, as in no lock icon, no warnings to the user. If it changes who provides it, it would be the same. And as a result, there's no scale or proportion of trust for a certificate authority. If you're a certificate authority, you're fully trusted by every single browser, as long as you're installed by default, which is the, the answer to the question of how does Alice learn trans public key. Your browser has the certificate authorities installed by default. And if you're installed by default, you have an enormous amount of power because you can sign for any website and make it look like, to the user, it's, it's they get the lock icon, nothing's wrong, that the browser, the session that they're communicating with is encrypted and everything is safe. So what can go wrong? What can go wrong with having browsers trust hundreds of certificate authorities from countries all over the planet, from companies, from government? What can go wrong? There was a researcher who wanted to propose a new security warning this is a bit verbose for a user to really understand. But the idea being that if a certificate authority changed, a user should be warned. Going back to this notion of tofu, trust on first use. Suppose you usually go to Bank of America and it was signed by a certificate authority in America. And then suddenly it's being signed by one not in America. Maybe that's something we should be warning users about. Maybe that's a sign of some suspicious behavior or a flaw in the certificate authority system. Because it is unlikely that the Bank of America would go to Russia, in this example, to get their certificate issued when they could easily get one issued by a certificate authority in America. There was a, a, an attacker who penetrated the Dutch certificate authority DigiNotar and had complete control of the company's certificate issuing servers during the operation. 
and he may have issued some rogue certificates that have not yet been identified. The final report from a security company commissioned to investigate the Jiji Notar attack showed that the compromise of the now bankrupt certificate authority was much deeper than previously thought. What does this mean? It means that someone broke into a CA, got access to their signing servers, and started issuing certs. An attack. And trusting hundreds of certificate authority means increasing the risk of these attacks. This was actually used to target Iranian dissidents and other people who were not totally on board with the government of Iran. And was used to buy, effectively by the government to be able to spy on these dissidents. So, negligence of these CAs has actual impact on humans, on human lives. But it gets so much worse. Because not only is your browser trusting these hundreds of CAs, these certificate authorities that your browser trusts, these are known as root CAs. So what's happening here? It's not the case that when you go to a website, it's signed by one of those hundred certificate authorities on your computer. Instead, it can be signed by anyone that those companies have vouched for as being good enough to be a certificate authorities themselves. CAs, root CAs, can sign certificates for other CAs, effectively ev ev elevating them to the level of being a full CA. So, you have Turk Trust, they sign a CA, they sign a, 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 a statement saying, this other entity, they're a CA now too. And you've never heard of them, and they can sign it now for somebody else, and signs it for someone else, who then signs some random public key that you've never seen before, saying that that's Bob. So the problem of having so many root CAs is compounded by the fact that any of these CAs can then vouch for any other entity, who can then vouch for other entities themselves. And yet this is what underpins the entire security of the internet, is getting the public key of the website that you're visiting. And it comes down to a chain of CAs signing on behalf of other CAs, signing on behalf of other CAs, signing on behalf of Bob. And it gets the lock icon, which is all the user really ever sees. So, Turk Trust, which was a certificate authority in Mozilla's root program, so installed by default on every single computer that had Firefox, would have Turk Trust trusted as a, a, a root CA. They misissued two intermediate certificates to customers. Now, they scanned their certificate database and log files because they do evidence collection and confirmed that the only this mistake only happened in these two specific instances. They only made this this mistake these for these two certificates. And as a result, Mozilla is actively working on revoking trust for these two issued certificates will be released to all supported versions of Firefox in the next update. Now, this is all historical. This is not live happening. But it just goes to show how there can be a certificate authority that you may have never heard of that is misissuing certificates intermediate certificates so to to allow other people to become certificate authorities themselves and this can just happen and your browser will just trust it because of one certificate authority having screwed up right they accidentally issued intermediary ca certs meaning that the people they issued them to became certificate authorities that could issue certs for anyone, and everyone who used Firefox would trust them. Right? These intermediary CA certs are just as good as root CAs. They're just not the ones included in the browser. 
the root CAs are included in the browsers, the intermediary CAs are just as good as the root ones. They can do all the same things. They can make other people into CAs if they want to. And so just because if you look at this list, a major corporation doesn't have a root cert, or a major country doesn't have a, a root cert, it doesn't mean that they don't have intermediate one, intermediate ones, that someone has issued them the ability to become a CA themselves. So that list of certificate is just the ones that are installed by defaults. But there's many, many more than just those. And there's thousands of intermediaries from non-democracies, from private companies, including defense contractors, that are able to issue certs for anyone, and your browser will just trust it. Another thing was that MD5 collision that we showed earlier, they can be used to create intermediary CA certs, meaning that not only can you create a certificate through an MD5 collision that is a certificate for a website, you can use it to make yourself into a CA. And this relates a bit to the assignment too, where it kind of depends on the file format how devastating these attacks can be. And it turns out for the format of a CA certificate, there's just a bit, a zero or one value, which basically says, are you a, a, an intermediate CA that can issue CA certs, or are you not? And if it was set to zero, you're, you're not a CA. And if you're set to one, then you become a CA. And so now finding a collision just means finding a collision where that bit is set, where that bit is actually the right value. And then in the latter part of the certificate, where the collisions are actually occurring, you have fields that you can just ignore. So there is a Netscape comment extension. So browsers just ignore it. It's just basically a field that says, oh, I'm a bunch of raw text. You can ignore me. I don't matter. It's just I'm there for additional information if you happen to be using the Netscape browser. So this allowed the people who discovered this collision to basically pick their prefix, this rogue CA cert, their, the key that they wanted, and all the extensions set as they want. And it was different from the serial number validity period in the real cert domain name. And then where the certs RSA key and other was, was, had presented, they created these Netscape comment sections, which were ignored and computed a collision there. So this was where they need the PlayStations. They use the PlayStations to do lots and lots and lots of hashings, knowing how to specifically target the MD5 algorithm, because it's not just brute force search, but they had exploited weaknesses in the algorithm itself. And the signature is the same. So the bottom part, because the length extension attacks on hash functions, the signature is the same. Importantly, the signature was valid for this fake certificate. Right? This created a skeleton key to atal allow a network attacker to break TLS for any website. If you have become a certificate authority and you're an attacker, you can break everyone's access to the internet. You can man in the middle everything. And all it takes is for a CA to accidentally make you one, or for a weakness in the MD5 algorithm, for example, to allow you to become one. And that's why these collisions really matter. Even if they are arbitrary collisions, being able to find collisions means that you can ha actually have more devastating impact than just finding two things that have the same value when they're hashed. So, this was their fake certificate. MD5 Collisions Inc. was the company they called themselves. They issued a certificate for localhost 127.0.0.1, which would be not anything that anyone could ever issue a certificate for, just as a proof of concept that the system was broken. You can see Equifax was the CA that was the signature. So the Equifax Secure Global eBusiness, that was the part at the bottom of this graph where you see the signature. They issued the actual signature on a real cert, and then they, the attackers used their PlayStations to have an MD5 collision to become a CA and thereby be trusted by every browser.
And as you can see here, for their particular certificate, certificate status, this certificate is okay. Because all the signatures matched, everything matched, nothing was wrong. The hashes were fine. The problem was MD5 should not have been used as late as 2008 to do something as important as all internet secure transport. Browsers trust too many CAs. And the security of HTTPS is only as strong as the practices of the least trustworthy and the least competent CA. The weakest link security. It just takes one incompetent certificate authority to be able to allow someone to become a certificate issuer and then issue certificates for anyone. And so we have this problem where if one of those companies on that list or one of the thousands that they've turned into CAs happens to get attacked and their computer's compromised and an attacker learns their keys, they'd be able to start issuing certificates all the time. Weakest link security. So fake certs is probably the easiest or the most practical way to break TLS, because as we talked about before, we're not breaking the crypto. We're not breaking public key cryptography. That's not the way to attack it. The way is to get people to stop using it or attack it in other ways. And having a fake cert is probably the easiest or the most practical way to break it. But one thing that's nice about this whole certificate infrastructure is that if it ever happens, it's obvious. If you look at a bad cert, It has to have been signed. So you have evidence. This is how a CA cannot claim, oh, that, that never happened. No, they actually signed the statement. So you can say, no, you signed the statement turning these people into CAs. You shouldn't have done that. And they can say, oops, sorry, please don't kick us out of the root CA program. And sure enough, they'll get let back in eventually. But there is this audit trail. These public key signatures are non-repudiable. So if I sign... If I'm negligent and sign a bad cert I shouldn't have done, I can't undo that. It's done. That signature is now on that cert. And so the Electronic Frontier Foundation has this thing called the SSL Observatory where they collect all of this information from all of the certificates that are seen. So they can actually do some high-level analysis of these certificates in practice to look for these kinds of attacks. So it's crowdsourced information that what are the actual certs that people are getting when they go to websites so they can look for patterns of attack and look for warnings, looking for rogue CAs and these sorts of things. How do we get certs? How, do, how does someone like us just go and get a certificate for their website? Well... You could pay one of those trusted authorities to give you one. And this was certainly their business model. But if you're just a regular person, you're probably not interested in spending too much money on a certificate. You could use something called a self-signed cert. And this was originally for backwards compatibility. The idea here is you just have a certificate that you sign with the public key that's named in the certificate. So it's basically a statement saying, Bob's public key is something, and then it's signed with that something key. So it doesn't tell the, the Alice anything. Alice just receives a message saying that Bob's public key is what I say it is, and it's signed by that key that I'm claiming it is. Well, it could be Eve if they're easily doing this. So a self-signed cert doesn't actually give you an authentic version of that of that key but it does allow you to basically use all of TLS without having to do something new this uh, TLS works with certificates so if you want to have HTTPS you need a certificate a self-signed cert was a way of not having to re-implement a new version of all the security you just use a self-signed cert and now you have support HTTPS without having to pay a bunch of money to a certificate authority it's still not an authentic channel, but interestingly, it does stop 
attacks. In fact, it stops a lot of attacks, in which case a self-signed cert is probably far superior than not having them at all. Because with a self-signed cert, you, you don't know if it's an authentic channel. It might be Eve. But you can apply tofu, trust on first use, so at least if it's if you're right the first time, you're going to be right forever. So if you had been right the first time, you've been secure all along and it's been secure and authentic, so that's great. But second, it stops someone else from being able to monitor your communication, like your ISP or anyone else on the network. Because if the option is not using encryption at all and just sending everything plain text, or using a self-signed cert and not being sure that it, it might be Eve, but, you know, it, it might also be Bob, you just don't know, at least you're still encrypting everything. At least you're still backing everything. So a network attacker cannot interfere with communication. They can't insert traffic, delete traffic, modify traffic, read traffic. You have confidentiality. If you're in a cafe and you're connecting to their Wi-Fi, it's no longer the case that everyone can listen to all of your traffic that's going in the Wi-Fi network because you're encrypting it with a certificate that may or may not be right, but at least it's probably not going to be from the people in, around you in the cafe. But despite that, Self-signed certs trigger so many alarm bells when you just browse the web. If you go to a website with a self-signed cert, a user is bombarded with failures and scary messages, and you have to go through multiple uh, settings options to add a security exception for this website. And the error is security error unknown issuer or self-signed cert, or this can vary. But what is a failure here is that if we accept that this is a reasonable behavior for a self-signed cert, then not having encryption at all should be unusable. The alarm bells, if you're just not having any security whatsoever, should be so much more intense than this. And instead, if you simply don't use any security at all, you get no alarm bells, you just don't see the lock icon. If you have a self-signed cert, you're actually protected from a broad amount of possible attacks but the user is bombarded with errors and failures that they have to understand in order to safely proceed. So the only real option that ever existed was to go and pay a bunch of money to a certificate authority so that they can basically do nothing and issue you with a certificate. Right, and other websites will behave differently. Like there's a problem with this website certificate was not issued by a trusted certificate authority. This site certificate is not trusted! Exclamation! You should not proceed, especially if you have never seen this warning before for this site. Now that's true. or your connection is not secure. Right? These are all warnings that occur, alarm bells, which are good to warn you that the encryption isn't working as you thought it should be. But the irony is that if you just simply don't use any encryption at all, there's no alarm bells, there's just no lock icon. Which is a strange situation when actually a self-signed cert is just the tofu model and prevents a huge number of opportunistic eavesdroppers from being able to tamper with your communication. Right? So here you go through the process of actually setting up a security exception. You have to get the certificate, confirm the exception, and so on. Right? This is the tofu model. This is the tofu model in practice. That is, you don't know if the cert is good, so you just trust it, and you hope that it's good. But the browsers have made this an unusable model because for an 
a typical user, the amount of alarm bells is too much for them to be able to actually use that site. So you'd have to go and buy a cert from CA. The problem is that it incentivizes not using security because not using security has no alarm bells. It has a bad incentive. In practice, it should be as hard or worse to use insecure sites. It makes no sense that it's easy to use insecure sites. It's easy to use sites signed by a, a proper certificate authority, but it's nearly impossible to use them if it's a self-signed cert. Right? Because in the worst, the best case of a self-signed cert, it's the real cert. The worst case, it's the same as not using security. So if it's the real cert, you win. And if it's not the real cert, it's no different than not using security, which is the alternative, effectively. Or at least it was, until Let's Encrypt came. Let's Encrypt is a free, automated, and open certificate authority that was recently, within the last six years or so, I believe, began to exist, and they offer free, automated, open cert signing. Open. They only do domain validation. They don't do OV, they don't do EV, they don't have human lawyers doing the work. It's all supported by donations and volunteers. Basically, if you control a website and you can control the DNS records and you can then get a, a cert signed with a public key from them. And importantly, in fact, crucially, browsers trust the Let's Encrypt cert. So it's included. It's on that list. So if you have the Let's Encrypt cert on your browser's core root of trust, then anything that they sign, you'll trust them as well. This basically stepped in for that self-signed cert gap, where for normal people who just wanted to have encryption on their website but didn't want to pay huge amounts of money to a certificate authority every three months or whatever, because they weren't actually making money off their website, but they just wanted encryption so that people had encryption when they visited it, Let's Encrypt solved that problem. How does it work? So it's domain validation. So basically, you tell Let's Encrypt, I want to cert, for example, .com. And you know, then they say, OK, well, put this random string at this random place on example.com and sign some message. And so then you reply back with a signature of that message and the key that you used to sign it. And then you put the magic number that they want, the, the challenge, at a particular place on your website. Then they do an HTTP get at the domain that they expect to see the result. They get the result, they confirm that that's the thing that they're expecting to see, and then they're happy. They send the all is clear. So this proves that the administrator of the web server has a particular signing key and can has administrative control over a domain, which is really all that the domain validation really is. The next step is that the admin then prepares a certificate to be signed. So now they take the actual public key that will be used for the website and prepare their certificate, name their website, all of the things that the certificate authority needs to sign, wrapping it with the signature for the admin. Let's Encrypt now knows that the admin, the signing key A, is the one that corresponds to the website being controlled by the admin, and having done the previous challenge, and so is therefore willing to sign the certificate itself. So Let's Encrypt then provides a signature for that certificate, and that's the, then the website can use that as their certificate, and users can benefit from encryption. When you want to revoke, you would prepare a statement saying, all right, here's the domain, here's the key, here's your certificate, in fact, the Let's Encrypt signed certificate that you had previously issued to me, signed with a public key for the admin, the, the administrative control over the web server, which Let's Encrypt knows is, in fact, the key that is able to ha have control over the domain. 
Let's encrypt then says, okay, it's revoked, adds it to a certificate revoke list or notifies the OCSP servers. And these then in turn tell the various browsers that this certificate is invoked. So Let's Encrypt began in 2014, it started as an EFF initiative backed by Akamai, Google, Facebook, Mozilla, and more corporations. So it was backed by large interests on the internet to create an open, free certificate authority. And now, and, and these numbers are from last year, has signed more than 380 million certificates on 129 million unique domains, making it the largest certificate issuer in the world. And last year, 75% of all Firefox web traffic was HTTPS, meaning that it was encrypted, meaning that it was secured. However, four years ago, it was 38%. And the reason is that self-signed certs were ineffective because of all the alarm bells, which were fair, but had there been more alarm bells for not using encryption at all, self-signed certs would have been far more prevalent, I'm sure. And as a result, websites were forced to either not use encryption or pay for a certificate. And Let's Encrypt changed that by allowing normal people the ability to get an actual cert signed by a certificate in the trusted store on browsers and you can get it for free they can they renew you get a new one and as a result web traffic now is far more encrypted than it has been in the past and it is likely the use of let's encrypt as a free certificate authority to allow this to have happened.